A video of a woman weeping on the floor, deep fake porn was made of her. A top AI ethics researcher gets fired after speaking out against their company's practices. And a chatbot helps a single writer cross the picket line, replacing a whole team. These are just some of the examples fueling a wave of anti-AI sentiment. It's easy to see why people fear our machinated future. What was previously relegated to science fiction is now rapidly approaching, and what AI we do have is already terrifying. Put into the hands of criminals, the state, and major corporations, what evil won't they commit? There's an impulse to oppose the growth of the machine at all costs. A ludist urge to decelerate its growth so we can figure out what the fuck we're gonna do before AI takes over. And I'm sympathetic to the cause, but I have a dark secret. I use AI. Like, a lot. I've been using large language models like ChatGPT and Google Bard whenever I have writer's block. I can ask them to summarize a book I've read, to criticize a passage of my essay, to come up with trending ideas for me, and so on. In Premiere Pro, I use the Remix tool, which uses AI, to extend or shorten background music as if it was always that length. In Photoshop, I can artificially expand images beyond what's there, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's tools on the horizon that can rotoscope characters onto your body automatically, tools that can create 3D models from prompts or images like a 3D version of Dolly, and so on. As one person working a regular full-time job, AI has been nothing but an augmentation to my work that helps speed up the process of making videos. And these new creative tools have the AI hype train barreling full steam ahead. But artificial intelligence has been here for a while now. Weak AI, or narrow AI, is used to describe artificial intelligence that's focused on one specific task. And it's everywhere. It powers the algorithms that serve you content on Google, Facebook, and YouTube. It's in the programs that automate tasks in Amazon's manufacturing and logistics and so on. While AI is currently trending the way crypto and blockchain was a year or two ago, bits and pieces of this technology are everywhere around the internet. And you might be surprised to hear that even before the early 2000s, people have been ringing the alarm bells about automation as far back as the 1830s. Books like The Paradise Within the Reach of All Men, Without Labor, or On the Economy of Machinery and Manufacturers. The list of 200-year-old manuscripts imagining how machines could transform human life are plentiful. But instead of painting the future as dystopian, these writings are largely utopic. Imagining a future where machinery and nature are used to eliminate the need for human labor. Automation theory, as it has come to be called, has come and gone from the popular consciousness for the past 200 years. The argument goes that the rise of automated machines in factories, computers and information technology, and today's focus, artificial general intelligence, or AGI, will put humans out of work. But each time automation theorists have predicted the jobs apocalypse, the results have been less than apocalyptic. We've been living with factory machinery and computers for a while now, but I'm still clocking into my 9 to 5, as I'm sure you are. So how do we separate the foam from the substance? Let's take a look at some numbers. Consider how much automation has already led to job loss. By one count, 57% of the jobs workers did in the 1960s no longer exist today. In the US, the overall numbers of manufacturing jobs fell by approximately a third from post-war peaks. In France, it fell by 50%, and in the UK, by 67. Meanwhile, manufacturing output has more than doubled since then, meaning technological breakthroughs have left less workers producing more goods, which is unfortunate for those workers who've been laid off. But the economy can handle a lot of displacement. Something like 60% of the jobs people work in now hadn't been invented in 1940. Despite that, global capital and the workforce has survived. We're just working different types of jobs. What's different this time, though, is the amount of jobs at risk in such a short period of time. According to Oxford researchers, 47% of jobs are likely to disappear in just a few decades. Meanwhile, OpenAI researchers have claimed 49% of jobs are vulnerable to ChatGPT automation. And the effects of this displacement at these speeds is expected to be historically unprecedented. 
by some estimates, more than 137 million workers in Cambodia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam are at high risk of replacement by machines, creating an upswing in trafficking and slavery across Southeast Asia. A treatise by the former head of Google China insists on global losses that'll cause a period of world historical turbulence. World historical turbulence. Now, that's a phrase that doesn't make me feel good about the future. And it's a premonition of an economic system we haven't seen before. Capitalism that no longer relies on human labor. But worry not, says the accelerationist, they have the perfect solution. If machines are destined to replace humans, which they are, then we must implement UBI, or Universal Basic Income, to prevent the worst from coming to pass. UBI basically amounts to some form of monetary support to everyone in a country despite their employment status, to make sure everyone has a minimum standard of living. And it's not some weird fringe idea either. Support is coming from figures like eBay's founder, the CEO of Slack, and even Mr. Twitter himself. It's harder to find a tech titan that hasn't come out in support of implementing a UBI. This level of support is surprising. We're talking about the Jeff Bezos and Tim Cooks of the world, figures who are notorious for their anti-labor decisions as CEOs. They don't want to pay a fair wage or support unionization, but they're all on board with the universal basic income? Uh, something sounds kind of weird, right? But let's save that thought for later. They're also joined by unlikely allies, the left accelerationists who, like the tech CEOs, find our salvation in the machines. Think of all the menial labor we've already automated away. Back in the day, a computer was an actual job title. They would follow a set of very labor-intensive tasks, like creating navigational tables, that we now have machine computers do. The work was mind-numbing and tedious. I doubt anyone aspired to be a computer. And now that job no longer exists, and we're all better off for it, including the worker who's now free to work in something more fulfilling. The accelerationists say that this is the promise of an AI future. We could usher in an era of post-capitalist utopia. Turns out, the Marxists had it all wrong. Whereas in previous centuries, capitalism was characterized by a struggle between labor and capital over land and resources, the proletariat is no longer the maker of history. Peter Drucker, author of 1993's Post-Capitalist Society, argues that knowledge has become the resource that'll guide 21st century struggles. It's what allowed computer work to be automated away, liberating humans from menial tasks, and it's what, hopefully soon, will liberate us from labor. The center character of this story, the new revolutionary, Drucker argues will be the universal educated person, someone able to pick up and run with the products of expert research in narrow fields and apply them generally, applying chaos theory to economics, genetics to archaeology, or data mining to social history. You see these universally educated persons in cities everywhere, at subway stations and coffee shops, hooked up to AirPods listening to music or podcasts, bits of data streaming from faraway servers into their cell phones, these these universal educated people of the new world are showing us a glimpse of the future. With a physical good like a CD, one person's use of it blocks other people from using it. But digital goods like MP3 files contain information that's torn apart and put back together when downloaded. The resource is the information that instructs the computer how exactly the bits get put together to play the latest song. Ben Reynolds, author of The Coming Revolution, dubs this distributed production, and it's supposed to change everything. Not only will AI automation be taking away our jobs, this new production paradigm will completely obliterate how we understand capitalism works. Instead of goods being centrally produced in factories and shipped all over the world, the information to produce goods will be shared freely, and goods will be produced locally like your phone digitally reproducing an mp3 file. For physical goods like clothes, Reynolds predicts 3D printers will play a central part in this. The technology has already advanced to where 3D printers can create complex medical devices and even food, and the technology is only going to get better. Today, 86% of the world's population carry personal computers with them. 
it's possible in the future we'll also have 3D printers, or at least access to them at home or in local libraries. The primary limiting factor for local printing is the blueprints to create goods or the knowledge and information of how to produce them. So Reynolds expects that goods will skirt around legal protections and intellectual property rights, and they will reduce the demand for many kinds of mass-produced goods. Why buy an iPhone when we can make an iPhone at home, you know? The demand for labor in these industries will also fall and people will lose their jobs as a result. There's no way around it. Distributed production cannot be uninvented. Most terrifying to the author is the invention of the printed gun, ghost weapons that can't be tracked, that might just be the weapon that fuels the next century of revolutions. But if we can survive the turbulence, if we can create a society that doesn't require waged labor to survive, we'll achieve it. We'll finally reach it. Post-capitalism. For the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem. How to use his freedom from pressing cares, how to occupy leisure, which science and compound interest will have won for him to live wise and agreeably and well. AI is just one piece of the puzzle to uncovering what our future holds, and the accelerationist model is just one such view. Visions of the future are varied, and for as much as I'd like to believe that the future will be as rosy as these authors do, I find it hard to believe. Take for example the scandalous finding that 40% of jobs will be lost to AI. These findings have been moderated by more measured studies like a 2016 OECD study that found that less than 10% of jobs were likely to be automated. The study was more robust than the previous one for a variety of reasons, and more importantly, it wasn't funded by the companies that are creating AI technology and want to sell you on it. Seriously, if we were to listen to the CEOs, ChatGPT might as well be digital gold. But even then, 10% is still a lot of jobs. The question of whether AI advancements will lead to job loss is undeniably yes. You won't find one serious person saying otherwise. But there's something we're missing here. Author Aaron Beninov centers his analysis on one primary question. Why are we so obsessed with technologically driven job loss? There's a recurring hype surrounding automation theory, one that's been happening since at least the 1800s. But frankly, I wouldn't be surprised if we found a manuscript by a caveman afraid that the invention of fire was going to cost him his role as hunter. Beninov argues that the cyclical nature of automation discourse has less to do with technology itself and more to do with the nature of capitalist society. Taking its periodicity into account, automation theory may be described as a spontaneous discourse of capitalist society that for a mixture of structural and contingent reasons reappears in those societies time and time again as a way of thinking through their limits. What summons the automation discourse periodically into being is a deep anxiety about the functioning of the labor market. There are simply too few jobs for too many people. Why is the market unable to provide jobs for so many of the workers who need them? Proponents of the automation discourse explain this problem of a low demand for labor in terms of runaway technological change. But this is misguided. In short, there's a fundamental problem in the labor market that's prompting these fears in the first place. As we discussed, a whole lot of jobs people used to do a hundred years ago no longer exist. But this isn't new. Automation is a constant feature in the history of capitalism. What is new, relatively speaking, is that global capitalism is now failing to provide jobs for the people who need them, and those of us who find them are often underemployed, doing jobs we're way too qualified to do. There's higher spikes of unemployment, inequality is only getting higher, something has gone wrong. Labor is in short demand. Automation theorists would argue, yeah, no shit. That's because of automation, baby. That's what we've been telling you. Robots took our jobs and they're only going to keep doing it. But Beninov argues we'd be wrong to chalk it up to simple automation, because if you look at the numbers, there's a deep economic rot at the center of this. Let's look at manufacturing, an industry that's already seen automation hit it in a big way. Already cybernetically enhanced, we would expect productivity and output to have skyrocketed, right? But this isn't the case. In fact, recent figures show the manufacturing industry diminishing, growing at a sluggish pace that doesn't compare with the post-World War II golden age. 
It's a classic crisis of overproduction and overcapacity. Demand for goods has stagnated compared to our ability to produce them, leading to a wave of deindustrialization. And manufacturing is only one such industry. Across the board, economic growth has stagnated. Some would argue that this is inevitable, if we're using the economy after World War II as the baseline. The global economy was booming after the war. Expecting it to stay like that, well, it's not a fair comparison. If we instead compare it to pre-World War I levels, things are much more similar. But here's the kicker. As Beninov explains, in that period, large sections of the population still lived in the countryside and produced much of what they needed to live. Yet in spite of the much more limited sphere in which labor markets were active, and in which industrialization took place, this era was marked by a persistently low demand for labor, making for employment insecurity, rising inequality, and tumultuous social movements aimed at transforming economic relations. In this respect, the world of today does look like this era. The difference is that today, a much larger share of the world's population depends on finding work in labor markets in order to live. Considering how you can't just grow food in your backyard like you used to a hundred years ago, this development is unsettling. Beninov admits that technological progress does play a factor here, but it's secondary to the primary issue of a stagnant capitalist engine that can't fuel economic growth to keep people employed. The difference today versus a hundred years ago is that the vast majority of the planet is now a part of this wage labor system. If this stagnation continues, it's likely to make the employment insecurity, rising inequality, and social movements of the past century look like child's play. The problem is capitalism, not AI or automation. As Beninov alludes to in the previous quote, the process of industrialization was horrific for workers as those who could find jobs found themselves living in cramped cities with poisoned waterways working 12-hour days. And as the book In Human Power explores, AI might just be the latest tool wielded by capital to bludgeon workers. Capital is reducing its dependence on labor. We should not expect this trend to reverse itself. If this trend is going to continue, which it most likely will, we should be very, very skeptical of AI. Depictions of AI as the outcome of a disinterested process of scientific research are naive. Machine intelligence is the product not just of technological logic, but simultaneously of a social logic, the logic of producing profits. Capitalism is the fusion of these technological and social logics, and AI is the most recent manifestation of its chimerical merging of computation with commodification. Jumpstarted by the digital experiments of the US military industrial complex, AI emerged and developed within a socio-economic order that rewards those who own the means of production for automating human labor, accelerating sales, elaborating financial speculation, and intensifying military police. What is apparent is that the owners of the great digital corporations regard AI as their technology, and with good reason. For it is they who possess the intellectual property rights, the vast research budgets, the labor time of AI scientists, the data and the centers that store it, telecommunication networks, and the ties to an enabling state apparatus that are the preconditions for the creation of AI. It is they, and their ranking managerial cadres, who are in a position to implant their goals and priorities within AI software and hardware, baking in their values, in practice, the one prime directive, to expand profits to its design. There is also no AI without deep exploitation. Congolese miners slave away in open pit mines. US prisoners churn out goods for cents on the dollar, and Bangladeshi garment workers toil away in dangerous and unsanitary conditions. These seeming extremes are two faces of the same process. The gleaming white halls of an Apple or a Google need the brutal foundations of cheap labor and extractive industry to exist. There are no iPhones without rare earth minerals. There is no capitalism without labor. Overseas workers get paid less than $2 an hour to moderate and train these algorithms and are the backbone which they'll be built off of, right alongside the senior engineers designing the algorithms. This exploitation is likely to give way to even more exploitation. Amazon already uses a complex system of surveillance in their workplace, using AI-powered cameras and detection algorithms to detect possible unionizers seems like an inevitable outcome. 
The proposal by companies like Google to produce digital cities seems like a utopian dream, but having a system that could precisely track your every movement more than we already do through the use of a citywide network of interconnected devices seems nightmarish. And the digital productivity tools companies are already using are only likely to become more and more sophisticated when equipped with deep learning algorithms. AI might just become a digital manager watching your every move and making sure you stay on task at all times. The standard assumption among the left and many others is that despite its toxic excretions, the more developed technology becomes, the easier it will be to produce socialism. But what if these technologies actually make it harder? Just as easily as it is to imagine a post-capitalist future where humans are freed from the burden of work, so too can we imagine a neo-feudalist society where the worst tendencies of capitalist society are amplified to their logical extreme. But the reality is, we don't know where AI will take us. As it stands, for as impressive the technology is, there is still the issue of the last mile. Products like AI chatbots and image generators are amazing, but still fail in some pretty rote and simple tasks like counting or drawing hands. This is a problem seen across the industry. Self-driving cars can handle most situations with ease, but fail to handle edge cases or sometimes randomly fail. They can get 90% of the way there, but the last 10%, the last mile, is where the toughest work must take place. And we're still not there yet. AI also is probably a bubble, like NFTs or crypto. I expect it'll pop sometime in the near future. But even if an AI bubble pops, AI isn't gonna end there. Sure, maybe the last mile will never be crossed, which would be both fortunate and unfortunate. Fortunate in that the terrifying realities it could usher would never come to pass, but unfortunate in that we'd never enjoy the fruits of that potential paradise. But just the same, AGI might really be on the horizon. And if you get political vertigo imagining the possibilities and what we have to do, that's good. It's unlike anything humanity has ever dealt with. The future is dark. It's hard to see what's up ahead. But we must, nonetheless, move forward into the abyss.